Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about healthcare topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Today's presenter is Dr. Anamalai Virapan. Dr. Virapan is board certified in gastroenterology. Dr. Virapan is the medical director for the Washington Hospital Gastroenterology Service. We're going to cover colon cancer today. The topics that I'm going to cover today are overview of colon cancer, key statistics, the risk factors, symptoms, diagnosis, staging, treatment, and prevention. So what is colon? It's large intestine, it's otherwise called large bowel. It's about five feet in length. It holds waste products for following digestion. And it, it transports the waste product through the colon into the rectum to be eliminated later. It absorbs primarily water and electrolytes. This is a picture that shows how colon appears. As you can see, the colon wraps around our abdomen and this little finger-like projection is appendix, and this is the end of the small bowel. This is where the large bowel begins. The beginning of the large bowel is called cecum. The, the part that is, goes up is called ascending colon. Ascending means going up. This goes across your belly, transverse. Transverse means going across. Coming down is called descending. And sigmoid colon is an S shape, that's why it's called sigmoid colon. And the last six inches is called rectum. And when we talk about colon cancer, we talk about both colon and rectal cancers. We can also say it's colorectal cancer. How does cancer develop? So, so there is genetic change that occurs that causes excessive growth of the inner lining of the colon. Now, the inner lining of the colon constantly gets changed. There are two sets of genes that control this. One set of genes puts a new lining on. The other set removes the old lining. When, when one of these don't work properly, that's when the excessive growth of tissue occurs. When excessive growth of tissue occurs, we call that as a polyp. It starts, the polyps are the one which potentially they can become colon cancer. So here you can see a normal colon, then you develop a polyp, and that polyp over 10, 15 years gradually grows to become cancerous. Statistics. Colon cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death among men and women, lung being the first and one in 10 people will be diagnosed with colorectal cancer. 90% of the colon cancers occur in people over the age 50. One in 10 of them are under the age 50, that's 10%. And for some unknown reason, lately we are seeing more and more of younger people coming down with colon cancer, people in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. They're coming down with colon cancer. What is being said about that is by year 2030, in people between ages of 20 and 34, there's going to be 90% increase in the rate of colon cancer. And when you take rectal cancer, the same age group, we expect 124% increase in colon, colon rectal cancer. We don't know the reason. We think. It's the way of, I mean, I mean, dietary habits, bad diet, weight gain, obesity, is one of the main reasons. 
If you're watching the news in the past week or two, there was a news about how obesity in millennials is going to increase the rate of cancers. There are about six cancers that are obesity related that are expected to increase in, in people who are between 25 and 50 years of age. They are gallbladder, pancreas, colorectal, kidney, uterus, and multiple myeloma, which is like a bone marrow blood cell cancer. These are cancers associated with obesity, and they are on the rise. And in 2017, there are 135,000 cases, new cases of colon cancer and 50,000 deaths from colorectal cancers. And that number is about the same or maybe a little bit more in 2018. This chart shows various countries and the prevalence of colorectal cancer. The top, the higher numbers, if you look at it, most of them are Western countries. If you look at the lower incidence in countries, mostly Africa and Asia. Again, it's more to do with diet. And between 91 and 2015, the death rate from overall cancer death rate has f fell by 26%, this colorectal cancer. And that's because of diagnostic methods are better, people awareness is there, well, treatment is better, and preventive methods are prevention and cancer screening, these things are responsible for this. What are some of the risk factors that one, one has to develop colon cancer? I said 50 years of age. Anybody over 50 years of age, there is higher risk of colon cancer. Family history, if someone in the family had colon cancer, the risk goes up. And the risk goes up definitely to a higher degree if anyone in the family had colon cancer below the age of 60. And Afro-Americans tend to have a higher risk and they develop cancers earlier than other people. The cancer tends to be more aggressive and the prognosis is, is less favorable in Afro-Americans. Personal history of colorectal cancer. If someone had colorectal cancer before, their chance of developing colorectal cancer again is, is much higher than normal people. And same goes for colon polyps. Colon polyps, people who have had colon polyps will get more, more polyps in the future. That's why we, we recommend screening them more often if they've had colon polyps. These are the last three are special situations. One is an inflammatory bowel disease that is ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. People who have had this are at higher risk of developing colon cancer. And after seven to 10 years of disease, they are at a higher risk. So we often screen them much, much more frequently than regular population, every one to two years. And the cancers in them develop very insidiously and it's very difficult to pick up. And again, if you don't pick up on time, the prognosis is not that good. Lynch syndrome is, is a cancer genetic syndrome. There's a genetic problem here. And people who have this tend to have right-sided colon cancers. They get these cancers pretty quickly. And they don't, most of the polyps take 10 to 15 years to become cancerous. In these individuals, polyps can become cancerous within a year or two. So we do rescreen them every year or two. Familial adenomatous polypus is commonly called FAP. That's again a genetic abnormality. This affected families, the members of the families, get hundreds and thousands of polyps in the colon. And they start to, they start to develop all these polyps at a younger age as teenagers. And by the time they are 30, they all develop colon cancers. So fortunately, most of them will have symptoms like bleeding, and we check the colon. If we find polyps like that, we remove the entire colon. That prevents them from getting colon cancer. Those are non-modifiable risk factors. We can't do anything about any of these things. What are the modifiable ones? Alcohol, 
tobacco, obesity, lack of physical activity, excessive consumption of red meat and processed meats, diets low on fiber, fruits, and vegetables. Symptoms. What are common symptoms? Change in the bowel habits. Each person has a particular type of bowel habit. If there is any change in the bowel habit, one should think of a colon issue, including colon cancer. Blood in the stool. A lot of things can cause blood in the stool. Not all blood in the stool is because of colon cancer or hemorrhoids. So quite a few things can do it. This is one of them. Unexplained weight loss. All of a sudden, you're losing weight without you trying it. Then you have to worry about tumor. And constant persistent abdominal pain. You should consult the doctor at that time. Diagnosis. Some of the procedures that we do to diagnose it, we need a tissue diagnosis. We can say you may have, you have cancer, maybe cancer, or scan shows possible cancer, but you need a tissue diagnosis. So you have to visualize the tumor and take a biopsy of the tumor. That's how we make the diagnosis. And usually we use colonoscopy or sigmoidoscopy. Colonoscopy is a full checkup, full examination of the colon with the scope, with the with the camera, and sigmoidoscopy is a partial examination of the colon, lower one-third of the colon. And both of them do find, they find cancer, we can biopsy them. And if on sigmoidoscopy, if you find cancer, you would need a colonoscopy just to make sure the rest of the colon is fine. And once you made the diagnosis of colon cancer, then you go through this imaging studies and blood test to figure out more about the cancer. So imaging study, we do chest x-ray to see whether or not the cancer has gone to the lungs. And we do CAT scan of the abdomen, CT scan. We do that, again, to scan the, we'll scan, we scan the lungs and, and the abdomen. The most common areas the cancer goes is liver and lungs. So the chest, I mean, CT scan will tell us whether or not there's any tumor outside of the colon. MRI is another way, but we prefer CAT scan more than MRI. And PET CT scan is a special type of CAT scan. The CT scan, but is also combined with nuclear medicine scan, where you inject a radioactive material into the bloodstream, and that'll light up the tumor if you have in your body. So anywhere in the body, we can pick it up with this, with this scan. It's a very useful test to find out whether or not the tumor is outside of the colon. And some of the blood tests that we do, blood count to see whether your blood count is lower, or whether you're anemic or not. The metabolic panel includes a liver test to see whether or not there is any liver test abnormality so that you can look for any liver metastasis. And CEA is, is a blood test that is often elevated in people with colon cancer. You can have colon cancer without elevation of CEA but if you have elevation of CEA with colon cancer, it's very useful when following up the patient after treatment. So the elevated CEA level will go down to normal when you have surgery, when you remove the cancer. After that, we follow this every three months to see whether or not it's going up. If it goes up, that means the cancer is coming back. So then we look for recurrence of cancer and try and find out where it is and treat it accordingly. And this is how the CAT scan will show the tumor. This is, a tum this is a liver. The whole thing is liver. The black areas are the tumorous areas in the liver. Staging. So we want to know if you have cancer, so what stage is it? Is it early? Is it late? That, that tells us the prognosis, what's going to happen to you after after the cancer is diagnosed, and also what kind of treatment modality we're going to recommend that depends on staging of the disease. This picture shows, this is colon, this colon wall, there's about four layers to it, and this is a polyp. This is a polyp, there's no cancer here. And the next is, this is a polyp, the purple one is supposedly the cancer. So it's at the tip of the polyp, it has not spread down, it has not involved any of the layers of the colonic wall. These green ones are lymph nodes that is not involved. 
So if you cut, during the colonoscopy, if you cut the polyp here, you got a cure. You don't need anything else. The, when you pick it up, this is the earliest stage you can pick it up. And as you can see, the tumor, when it grows more and invades the colonic wall, we call, with the first two layers, we call it stage one. When it goes through all the layers, it's called stage two. When it goes beyond the colonic wall and also involves the lymph nodes, see this guy is turned purple now, that is stage three. When it is all over the body, liver, lungs, inside the belly, then that's stage four. If you're at stage one, there's 94% survival and cure rate. Stage two, 82, stage three, 67, stage four, dismal, 11%. Treatment. Depends on the stage, I told you. Let me take one at a time, colon versus rectum. The rectum is a little bit of a different breed. The rectum is way down, it's in a very tight space. So it's very easy for the tumor to spread outside of the rectum. So it's somewhat more difficult to treat somewhat more morbid treatment and also prognosis is also less favorable compared to the colon. In stage, stage one of colon cancer, you do surgery, they get a cure. Stage two, when it goes through the colonic wall, mainstay is surgery, some people may benefit from chemotherapy. There are some special situations where we give in addition chemotherapy. Stage three, that when it breaks through that colonic wall and it involves the lymph node, that's when the surgery alone is not enough, so we give chemotherapy. Stage four, when it is all outside of the colon in the liver and lungs and all the other places, the only thing that would, that's gonna help you would be chemotherapy. Surgery we do in some special situations, such as colon obstruction or heavy bleeding, then we go and take care of the colon at that point by surgery. Otherwise, we don't do surgery for them. When it comes to rectum, again, if it is a very early cancer, surgery will take care of it. When it is stage two or stage three, you can go either or. Chemo radiation means chemotherapy and radiation, combined treatment. So you give chemo radiation first, then you do surgery, then you get more chemotherapy or you can do surgery first, chemo radiation next, then more chemotherapy after that. It depends on the centers, how the, uh, what they are used to. And of course, on the stage four, only chemotherapy and rarely surgery. Suppose if there is a blockage, then you divert the colon, that's kind of surgery that might be necessary. Prevention. So uh, six out of 10 colorectal deaths could be prevented if someone had a routine screening done. 60%, 60 percent, 60 percent of 135,000 patients, I told you, right? 60 percent, you're talking about 70,000 cases could have been prevented with, with a screen. The removal of precancerous polyp reduces the chance of getting colon cancer by 70 percent. Screening is the most important prevention. Well, there are several methods of screenings. I'll go over one after the other. First is fecal occult blood testing. We call it FOBT or FIT. That's done annually. We patients submit sample of stool to the lab. It's simple, no bowel preparation, no sedation. And it's, it, it, does fail. It, it doesn't pick up everything. The sensitivity varies anywhere from 10 to 80%. There's a very wide variation in the sensitivity. Sensitivity means the ability to pick up abnormality. And risk of false positive is there. Positive test requires a colonoscopy. And because you don't get a tissue this way. The next one is tool DNA. You may have heard of this. Cologuard is on the radio, television is being advertised. This is, a, you, can, you collect the entire stool and send it to the laboratory by mail. If it is done, it's done every three years. 
It's also a very simple one. You collect it, they send you the kit, you collect it, um, put it in there and send it to the lab. The sensitivity is and specificity is a little bit better than the FIT. This detects stool DNA. DNA is the cells that, that are shed every day. Uh, you can, we can pick up abnormal cells, DNA. This actually, this particular test relies more on the fecal occult blood than the DNA, but the combination is a better. So again, this is a simple test. It's a lower accuracy. Positive test will require a colonoscopy as the next step, and you do it every three years. Septin 9, this is a blood test that's available. It's a simple blood test. We, we, do, we don't think it's very effective, so it's not actually recommended as a screening test. Virtual colonoscopy is a 3D imaging. You, you clean the colon like you would do for a colonoscopy. After that, you have a CAT scan done. The CAT scan images are kind of 3D imaging. They figure that as a 3D imaging, and that shows the colon like a colonoscopy would. And it, it's, it, thorough cleansing is still required. There's a lot of radiation involved. And it lacks the ability to, to sample the tissue. Oftentimes, it's not covered by the insurance. And it may not detect small polyps. And the high likelihood, I mean, the, it can pick up lesions outside of the colon. That may lead to unnecessary tests sometimes. Because it may pick up some benign lesions as a spot in somewhere, say, for example, a kidney spot it picks up then you know you worry about it, whether it is cancer or tumor or anything, then you go after it with biopsies, and biopsies may not show anything, then you go to surgery, you know. It may lead to sometimes unnecessary tests. And, um, but this is, they are working to reduce the radiation exposure. They are also figuring out a way to do it without cleaning the colon. So this is something to watch out for in the future, it may be the way to do a colon cancer screening. Because if they reduce the radiation, if you can do it without cleaning your colon, no pain, that's probably the best screening exam you can get. So this is something to watch for in the future. As of now, we recommend it every five years. This is how it appears when you make a 3D imaging of the CT scan images. This is how it, it appears. This is a polyp. Flexible sigmaroscopy. This is a scope test. It examines a part of the colon, examines a lower one-third of the colon. It's got to be done every five years. And there's no sedation required. And we can biopsy the abnormal growths. And it, it does not examine the upper colon. And bowel cleansing is required, but not as much as one would do for colon exam. And complications can occur, but it's not very common. Positive tests will require colonoscopy. Capsule colonoscopy. This is a pill camera. It's a little, little capsule like this. It's got camera at both ends. You swallow that and goes down and takes pictures. And we do it exclusively for esophagus and small bowel these days, but they're developing it for colon as well. And this also requires thorough cleansing. And it lacks the ability to sample tissue, of course. And low accuracy rate compared to colonoscopy. FDA has approved this only for usage in people who have had an incomplete colonoscopy, meaning that you had a colonoscopy, it was not complete, rest of the colon is not seen, then you can do this. That's the only indication as of now. It's not indicated for screening. Colonoscopy. This examines the entire colon, and you can remove the polyp. You can remove polyps. You can sample the lesions. It's usually done every 10 years. If you find a precancerous polyp, that is the adenomatous polyps, we call it, you do it every three or five years, depending upon the size, number, and the type of polyp. So it's got a high ability to detect, but it's not it won't detect everything. Can it miss lesions? Absolutely. Missing lesions is still a possibility with colonoscopy. 
Thorough cleansing is required. It requires sedation. You have to take a time off, one day off. And you have to have someone drive you home after the test. It does require a diet change and medication change. And there is potential complications, rarely. 99% of the time, everything goes well. But rarely you can have complications, such as perforation, bleeding, bleeding requiring a transfusion, perforation re requiring a surgery to remove the perforated part of the colon. And this is a diagrammatic representation of colon polyp and how we use a little snare to remove a polyp. And we pass the scope all the way around. We sedate the patient before we do that. We recommend colonoscopy as a preferred colorectal cancer prevention test. And you can do any one of the above ones. But this is more thorough. You can take care of a lot of stuff at the same time. That's why we recommend this. The best test for an in, this is the bottom line. The best test for an individual patient is, is one that the person is willing to undergo and repeat over time. That's, that's the most important. And our goal is to increase the overall rate of screening. Any one of the tests is better than doing nothing. Prevention, other preventive measures, aspirin, vitamin D, folic acid, calcium, B6, selenium, postmenopausal hormone therapy. These are all tried as preventive measures, except for aspirin and vitamin D, all others research shows that they are not very beneficial. Aspirin, there are two types of prevention. Primary prevention, secondary prevention. Primary prevention is you prevent before you get the disease. Secondary prevention is you, again, you prevent after you get the disease so that you don't get the disease back. So primary prevention, aspirin can benefit patients who are at a high risk for colon cancer, like some of the genetic syndromes I, I, I mentioned. And particularly it was tried, the Lynch syndrome that I talked about uh, with a high success rate. People who have had high risk of cardiovascular disease, we recommend it. Benefit is not confirmed in other groups of patients. Secondary prevention, it improves the survival in patients who are undergoing therapy for early colorectal cancer. Vitamin D, we think it's beneficial if someone is deficient in vitamin D. Others, we don't know yet. And this is the current screening that's going on now. It's about 65% of the patients are being screened on a regular basis. 8% they're screened, but not up to date. But this segment of patients have not been screened at all. Our goal is to get to everybody. What can you do to reduce the risk of getting colon cancer? Exercise, we think 150 minutes, two and a half hours a week is what we recommend. Eat healthy, Ms. Kim Alvari, she's gonna talk next. She's an expert on this. She's gonna advise you on that. Smoking, drinking in moderation. What do you mean by moderation? For women, not more than a glass of drink a day. For men, two, two glasses, not more than that. Of course, losing weight. We talked about obesity causing cancers. Colon cancer is preventable, treatable, beatable. If you are over 50, we wanted to get tested. And the American Cancer Society now recommends this age to lower this age to 45. Thank you.